I'm Dr. J and this is a video about comparing means. This video is on the heels of a couple of videos talking about comparing binomial probabilities and it will take very much the same approach. Uh, this video will actually probably be split down into three videos because there's uh, enough to talk about even in this sort of succinct whirlwind tour of comparing normal means uh, even when I'm not even giving you anywhere close to all of the details. Okay. So uh, we have a model. Uh, this is a model that we've talked about quite a bit before. It's a model for a single group, but multiple observations from that group. Uh, you assume that they're independent, those observations. They're normally distributed, a mean that is mu and a variance that's sigma squared. And we talked about a whole number of statistical techniques that you can use to make statements in particular about the normal mean. Sometimes we talked about the standard deviation or variance, but typically we are focusing on that mean. Uh, now, if we talk about uh, this mean, usually from a frequentist approach, we're interested in the distribution, sampling distribution of this statistic right here, which was the T statistic. Uh, we calculated p-values associated with particular hypothesis tests of the mean being particular values. We talked about constructing confidence intervals for that mean. If we take a Bayesian approach, then we get a posterior distribution from mu. We can get from that posterior expectations or credible intervals. We also talked a bit about how to calculate posterior model probabilities, but more importantly, perhaps to calculate posterior probabilities of that parameter being, say, greater than or less than a particular value. In this note, now the key is that we're going to talk about what happens when you have more than one group, right? So say you have two groups. In two groups, what we're going to assume is that we have observations from each of those two different groups. So the notation here, we have a Y, and it's now subscripted by both G and I. And the reason here is that because there's going to be some observations from group 1 and some observations from group 2, and so those from group 1 are going to be Y, subscript 1, comma, and then whatever number that individual is in that group. And then the second group is going to have Y, subscript 2, comma, numbers 1 up to whatever. Now, the, at least the initial assumption here is going to be that the parameters for these two groups are different. So we have a mean for group one, we have a mean for group two, and we have a variance for both groups as well. And now, typically what we're interested in is saying something about the means of these two groups. That is, we're interested in comparing mu one and mu two. And so we can take very much the same approach that we took previously. We're going to have the sampling distribution of some statistic, this is the statistic that people focus on. Uh, that can allow us to calculate p-values for a particular hypothesis test, for instance, that the two means are equal. For constructing confidence intervals, we can take a Bayesian approach and we can get a posterior distribution for the two parameters. Uh, we can construct credible intervals for their difference. We can calculate probabilities of hypotheses being true. We can calculate uh, probabilities of comparisons of those two parameters. Uh, all right, so I just want to note here that generically in my uh, Bayesian posterior notation, I just conditioned on Y, but Y always sort of represents all of the data, right? So uh, this is sort of an extended version, but just think of it as all the data. Okay, so uh, let's get into an example. So suppose you have a manufacturing facility that's uh, producing some kind of sensor, and you measure the sensor sensitivity of some of those sensors, uh, as, you know, maybe a random sample as they come off the line or something like that. Uh, at this point, you have two different processes that produce these sensors, and you're trying to evaluate which one might be better for a particular purpose. Uh, and so, uh, you might have something like this in terms of summary statistics. So, in each group, you have some number of observations. You also have a sample average and a sample standard deviation for those groups. And that is going to be sufficient to determine uh, everything that you need to determine uh, for calculating p-values and confidence intervals, credible intervals, and so forth. All right, so if you're uh, a frequentist, right, then um, you might want to do what's called a two-sample t-test. This is the standard test to compare the equality of two means. Uh, in R, you can do it using, uh, so there it is, right, this is the uh, null hypothesis says that the two means are equal, the alternative says that they're not. I R, the function t dot test will do that for you. So this p-value in this case uh, is a pretty small value. So again, that would indicate that your data seem incompatible with the null model. Here, the null model is all the assumptions that are associated with that null hypothesis. So one is that the means are equal, but we also have these assumptions of independence, normality, uh, variances that are constant within group, but possibly different across the groups. 
And so at this point with a small p-value, you might want to go uh, and do a little bit more exploration about what is really going on. You'll also see that the output includes a confidence interval. That confidence interval is a confidence interval for the difference in the means in those two groups. So that number here was about what, negative 2.6 to about negative 0.4, right? That's that range in that confidence interval. Um, again, if we only were given that confidence interval, we would immediately know that that p-value was less than 0.05 because that 95% interval does not include uh, the value zero. All right, um, if you go a Bayesian approach, uh, then you need a prior, and the prior is basically going to be the same as what we had before, but now we have two different variances, and so the prior is just the product of those two variances. If you assume that prior, then you get posteriors for the mean that are independent across the two groups, that have a t-distribution whose degrees of freedom depend on the number of individuals in each group, um, right? So for group one, it's n1 minus one, for group two, it's n2 minus two. Uh, they both have a location parameter that's the sample average. Uh, they have that scale parameter that's the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size within that group. And if you have this, these t-distributions, then you have everything you need to have for posteriors for each of the individual parameters. Um, what we're going to use in a second is some code that uses the location scale version of the t distribution to actually draw some samples from the posterior. So if we can draw samples from a standard t distribution, and we can do that easily in R, then we can calculate draws for these mu parameters in the posterior by multiplying by the scale parameter and adding the location parameter for each group right, separately. Uh, all right, so um, this is just an example of realizations from that simulation process. So we have that blue histogram is the simulations from process two. The red histogram is simulations from process one. Uh, again, because we actually know the exact posterior here, we would not need to do these simulations. We could draw nice smooth lines according to those location scale T distributions. But the reason that we're going to draw samples is because in a second, we're going to calculate differences, and, uh, right? And in order to calculate those differences, what we'll do is we'll use the samples. And so here, this uh, code up here, where it says mutate diff equals P1 minus two, that's just calculating the differences between those two uh, simulated realizations, not two, the collection of simulated realizations for uh, mu1 and for mu2. And now that we have those simulated differences, we can calculate estimates of, say, posterior expectations by taking the mean, of credible intervals by taking the quantiles of those simulated values, and finally, we can calculate estimates of that posterior probability that one parameter is less than the other by taking this mean of that difference being greater than zero. That really just calculates that posterior probability. You can see here that the posterior probability that I guess theta mu one minus mu two is greater than zero is very small, right? That was 0 0.006, right? Indicating that you should have a high belief that actually P two is larger than P one. And it's great because that's what this picture shows you. Okay. All right, so our next video is going to talk about what you do in situations where you have more than two means. Hope to catch you there.